royal priesthood Come and praise Him Holy nation Worship Jesus Our Redeemer He is precious King of glory Come and worship Royal Priesthood Come and praise Him Holy nation, worship Jesus, our Redeemer, He is precious, King of glory. A child is born for us, a son is given to us, and he shall be called Prince of Peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Dear brothers and sisters, it's always a privilege and an honor to be with you. Today we come to you virtually uh, through the miracle of modern technology. We're here today to celebrate the gift of Our Lady Queen of Peace, that God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and Jesus, knowing that we needed that kind of maternal care, was, as he left to go back to the Father from the cross, gave to us, his brothers and sisters, the children of the Father, he gave us his very own mother, Our Lady Queen of Peace. So today we'll celebrate this Mass of Our Lady Queen of, Meese, uh, Queen of Peace, and we'll remember with great fondness the gift of Our Lady appearing in Medjugorje. For the times in our lives that we have failed, to be ministers of peace, let's call to mind our sins. Lord Jesus, you are Son of God and Son of Mary. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. Lord Jesus, you came to bring us healing, healing in our minds, healing in our body, but more so healing in our soul. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you give us your body and blood, soul and divinity in the Eucharist, our food for all eternity. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Lord our God, you sent your only Son to bring peace to our world through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin. Hear our earnest prayer. Grant that our times may be tranquil, so that we may live as one family, united in love for one another, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nehushta, daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, just as his forebears had done. At that time, the officials of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked Jerusalem and the city came under siege. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, himself arrived at the city while his servants were besieging it. Then Jehoiakim, king of Judah, together with his mother, his ministers, officers, and functionaries, surrendered to the king of Babylon, who, in the eighth year of his reign, took him captive, and he carried off all the treasures of the temple of the Lord and those of the palace, and broke up all the gold utensils that Solomon, king of Israel, had provided in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had foretold. He deported all Jerusalem, all the officers and men of the army, 10,000 in number, 
and all the craftsmen and smiths. None were left among the people of the land except the poor. He deported Jehoiakim to Babylon and also led captive from Jerusalem to Babylon, the king's mother and wives, the functionaries, and the chief men of the land. The king of Babylon also led captive to Babylon and all 7,000 men of the army and a thousand craftsmen and smiths, all of them trained soldiers. In place of Jehoiakim, the king of Babylon appointed his uncle Mataniah king and changed his name to Zedekiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's responsorial psalm, for the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us. For the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us. O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple, that they have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the corpses of your servants as food to the birds of heaven, the flesh of your faithful ones to the beasts of the earth. For, For the, the glory, glory of your name, of your name O Lord, Lord, deliver us. They have poured out their blood like water round about Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury them. We have become the reproach of our neighbors and the scorn, derision of those around us. O oh Lord, how long? Will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? For the, For the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us. Remember not against us the iniquities of the past. May your compassion quickly come to us, for we are brought very low. For the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us. Help us, O God, our Savior, because of the glory of your name. Deliver us and pardon our sins for your name's sake. For the glory, the glory of, your of your name, O Lord, deliver us. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Alleluia. May the Lord be in your heart and on your lips to make proclaim this gospel wordly well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My sisters and brothers, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty deeds in your name? Then, I will declare to them solemnly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house, but it did not collapse. It had been set solidly 
on rock. And everyone who listens to these words of mine but does not act on them will be like a fool who will build his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house. And it collapsed and was completely ruined. When Jesus finished these words, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you have been following along in your Magnificat and doing the daily readings, or if you were paying close attention to the reading today, it's from the Book of Kings. As a matter of fact, we've had readings from the first and second Book of Kings. And this is a story of Jerusalem, the people of Israel, and how they have interacted with the Lord from about the time of the death of King David to the Babylonian exile. So the middle period, for about 500 years, you have this historical record of these kings, some good, more bad. And they come and they, they sometimes, because they're human, they fall and they have the, um, the need to self-aggrandize and to seek power. And they forget who the real king is. And that's the message. This book of kings is pointing who the real king is. And time and again, when the nation of Israel is falling down, the Lord will send a prophet. He will send someone to speak to the king himself and remind them who the real king is. The towering figure in both the first and the second book of Kings of all the prophets who was sent, the real one is the one named Elijah. Now, Elijah was, as they, my scripture professor said, he was a hick from the sticks. Scriptures say he was a Tishbite from Tishbe, a place that is now in the country of Jordan. And he sort of appears out of nowhere. He doesn't seem to come from a priestly caste. He doesn't come from another royal family. He doesn't come from power or wealth. Here comes this man from the country, and he goes up and he starts talking to the king. And scriptures tell us, that Ahab, the king that he spoke of, was the most wicked of all the kings of Israel. So Elijah has the greatest job cut out for him. And he goes and he confronts Ahab, and Ahab, of course, is furious. And so Elijah has to flee for his life. And if you were listening to, if you were reading the first book of Kings back a few weeks ago, back in June, uh, back in the early part of June, you would have heard that Elijah comes upon this widow in Zarephath, that the Lord sends him away from Ahab to a place where he'll be safe. And you know the story so well. He comes into this little village, this pagan village, and he meets this widow and he says, ma'am, would you give me something to eat? And she says, I'm sorry, I've got just enough flour for my son and myself and I'll cook a little cake, and when I do that, we shall both die. And Elijah says, do that, but don't do that, but do <laughs> first, make a little cake for me, and the Lord will take care of you. And so she does. And so it says in the book of Kings, she was able to eat for a year, and Elijah and her son as well. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry. What do we learn from that? What do we learn on this day where we think about Our Lady of Medjugorje, the Queen of Peace, and, and all the things that are going on in our own lives? We learn that we're a people of need. In the story from the Book of Kings, we realize that this prophet has been sent by God. First, he doesn't really know where he's going. He just wants to get away from Ahab. 
He knows that the ruler of Israel, the king of Ahab, it says, has done more to provoke the Lord than any of his predecessors. Elijah's first need is food. He gets sent from a land that's in drought to a place where the Lord himself says he will feed him. He will feed the prophet with ravens. We heard that Elijah now comes and meets this foreigner, a woman who's also in need. She and her only son have just the tiniest bit of flour. They have just a little bit of oil. But her need is more than food. Her need is hope. Remember that she said, after we eat this, we shall die. This mother is not only preparing for her own death, but she's preparing for the death of her child. They have been deprived of the desire to live. Into this moment comes a messenger from God, comes a prophet. The Lord has brought them together in their need so that he can feed his Jewish and his Gentile children. From her, she learns to trust in the prophet. She and her children are rewarded with a miracle. She, for more than one year, has flour that does not run out and oil that does not run dry. And so it is with us today. We are a people in need. We are a people who are starving, sometimes without hope. Like no time in modern American history, we have had an incredible one-two punch. At the turn of the year, we heard about a disease that was spreading through China. By February, we heard that it was ravaging Italy and the rest of Europe. And by March, it was our problem. On top of that, our country is now dealing with the thorny issue of race relations. We are a people in need. And so, like Elijah, we turn to the Lord. We remember that we go where he sends us and we follow his mission. When we meet people along the way, we bring them the message of hope that we have received. We accept their hospitality and we show them our gratitude for our common humanity. Any of us who've ever had the privilege of going to Medjugorje know what it's like to be in that place of peace. We know what it's like to be a pilgrim. So many of us have left this country, or maybe you're watching someplace else, and, and, and you know what it's like to leave and to leave your own homeland feeling like you have a very special need. Maybe you haven't even told anybody what it really is. Maybe there's a secret in your heart that you carry to Medjugorje. And for most of us, we had to take planes and trains and automobiles to get to that place. This beautiful, sleepy little village in the middle of the mountains. And we landed and we, and we came in and for myself, it was on a bus. And it was, I didn't even need a, a sign saying that we had entered the village. I promise you, I could have told you we were now in Medjugorje because I just felt the peace. I just felt like I was in a protected land. And so Elijah was scared. He left a land of drought. He went to a foreign land. Someone could have killed him. Travelers are very vulnerable. And when you take that need with you and you go to the place where there is such peace, and there is such love and there's such warmth, and we meet those strangers and we find something that tells us that God has heard us. And we know that our pilgrimage has been successful. Today, we're not there, we're doing this virtually. We remember and we pray for the people of Medjugorje. It's a quiet, sleepy village, but it's a place that's opened its heart to the rest of the world. And for them, they must feel very isolated right now with all the problems. But Our Lady is still there. Our Lady will not leave them. We heard in the gospel today, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Doing the will of the Father in heaven is what we were put here on earth to do. And we know that we are meant to be joyful in that. In fact, there was an Orthodox theologian who once said, the natural state of a Christian is joy. Let me say that again. 
the natural state of a Christian is joy. If we know what it's like to feel cherished and loved, it's amazing how nothing else seems to matter. That's the thing that brings us peace. Imagine how Our Lady must have felt. First, when Gabriel came and talked to her and spoke to her, and he used this beautiful name, he called her, he said, Hail, O highly favored daughter. What was that like? This messenger from God who told her that she was a highly favored daughter. Her whole life she'd been taught to love the Father in heaven. Then she was told that she would have this unique and unrepeatable gift. She would become the mother of the Son of God. Finally, she learned from the angel Gabriel that this would be accomplished by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in her very body. It's, it says he will overshadow her. She knew what it was like to suddenly herself be covered in a mantle. Maybe that's why Mary is so beautiful in covering us in her mantle. She's learned it firsthand. And so she takes her mantle and she covers us. That's the beautiful feeling of being cherished. But even though Mary was a disciple, she also knew what it was like to have to follow the teachings of her son. One of the things in the Gospel of Matthew, it's recorded Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? That's we hear, we hear Jesus in the Gospel tell, us, tell this, his followers that they're the salt of the earth. Here the Lord points out something that's a troubling concept that the taste of, sa of salt can be lost. We don't think about that. The taste of salt can be lost. Practically speaking, I don't know if that's even possible, but I do know that metaphorically it is. Have you ever met someone who has lost their zeal? How many people do you know who are despondent or bitter or lifeless or cynical? Some medical numbers from today bear this out. 12.7% of the U.S. population over the age of 12 took antidepressant medications within the last month, according to an analysis from the National Center for Health Statistics. The increase in the percentage of people using antidepressants between 1999 and 2014, in those 15 years, the increase of use was 64%. Women are twice as likely to take antidepressants as men, roughly 16% to 8%. Now this isn't meant to be critical in any way, merely observational. Neither do I want to offer an overly simplistic idea that a couple of Aves will make everything better. But I would like to take notice that if we are a people who have lost our saltiness our spiritual lives are in need of renewal. Our Lady Queen of Peace knows this. Her message from May 25th of this year, she sent us this message. Dear children, pray with me for a new life for all of you. In your hearts, little children, you know what needs to be changed. A prayer life connects us with someone we know we can trust. It can lead to a greater sense of peace. A mother can sometimes tell us what we need to hear, but don't want to hear. She says what needs to be changed. Mary said, you know what needs to be changed. If anyone has ever spoken to you like that, if they completely miss the mark, you think, that's a little weird. I think I'm just fine. But for a lot of us sometimes, it's like they've peeled back the onion. It's like they've taken the mask off the imposter. And they say, and they just, they don't say it out loud, they just look at us and they say, you know what you have to do. And it's like a dagger to our heart. It's like, how do you know? How can you read it? Is it so obvious? Change is a difficult thing for a lot of us, isn't it? Even when something is bad, we're willing to stick with it until it gets better by itself, right? 
it'll get better, I'll just leave it alone, it'll get better. We want the bad things to get better, but there's an old expression in the South, wishing don't make it so. This great priest here in Washington, Father Pat Smith, pastor of St. Augustine's Parish here in DC. And he tells the story, Pat's in a, in a, in a part of town where you know, a lot of people come to him with a lot of, a lot of difficulties. And he is a very plain spoken man. And people will come up to him with all kinds of problems, addictions and other things. And they'll say, Father, I just want to get better. And they'll say, really? How bad do you want to get better? And they'll say, really bad, really bad. And then they'll hit him right between the eyes. And he'll say, okay, just do this. Um, oh, um, no, Father, I, I, I don't think I could do that. And he'll say, I thought you said you really wanted it to get better. And they'll say, well, I do. And he'll say to them, if you want to, how bad do you want it? We need to hear that from time to time. We need to be challenged. Still, there are other people or circumstances that they can't change. What about them? Well, Our Lady knows that life is difficult. In her final message to Miriana in March, she said this, I see beautiful things and I see sad things, but I see that there is still love and that one should endeavor to make it known. My children, you cannot be happy if you do not love one another, if you do not love in every situation and every moment of your life. So often, we let the events of our life defeat us. We feel like we have to be what other people want us to be. We want great things for our children. Think of Our Lady at the cross. Deep inside of her, she had to have a peace that related to the Father. The Holy Spirit walked with her back from Calvary and kept her company until Easter Sunday morning. And he'll do that with us too, if we let him. Mostly, we're afraid to do so because we're afraid that if we ask, the answer will be no. But remember the words of Mary's son. If you then who are wicked know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? If we go where God sends us, if we are willing to make the necessary changes, if we are willing to walk with Our Lady and the Holy Spirit, we will find peace. May God bless each and every one of you every day of your lives. Dear brothers and sisters, we stand uniting our prayers to those of Our Lady Queen of Peace and ask her for the things that we really need. For the church, the pope, our bishops, priests, deacons, and religious, that they would be led in courage for the truth of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord. hear our prayer. For our world, suffering in this time of change, separation, loss of loved ones, loss of livelihood, and uncertainty about the future, that world leaders would turn to Jesus Christ and all nations find their hope and purpose in him. For this we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For peace in the world, for all people to heed Our Lady's call to repentance from sin, faith in her Son, and the resulting salvation of souls, for this we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the visionaries and families of Medjugorje, that God would strengthen them, console them, provide for them, and reward them for 39 years of welcoming pilgrims to Medjugorje. For this we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, the suffering, the lonely, the abandoned, the incarcerated, the hospitalized, that all believers and children of Our Lady would remember and live out our Lord's call. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, I was sick and you cared for me. Inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. For this we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died, 
that our prayers would accompany their souls from this world safely to the kingdom of heaven, especially those souls who have no one to pray for them. For this we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to gather around the table. We promised that you would be with us. Hear the prayers of your children offered through the hands of Mary, our mother, and through Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands will become our spiritual drink. Pray, dear friends that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Lord, as we lovingly venerate Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, as Queen of Peace, we offer you the sacrifice of reconciliation. Be pleased with our offering, and bestow on your family the gifts of unity and peace. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, as we honor the memory of the Blessed Virgin Mary, to Proclaim with fitting praise the greatness of your name. She is your lowly handmaid, receiving your word from the angel Gabriel, and conceiving in her virginal womb the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. She is the faithful mother, standing fearless beside the cross, as her Son sheds his blood for our salvation and reconciles all things to himself in peace. She is the disciple of Christ and the daughter of peace, joining in prayer with the apostles as she awaits your promised gift, the spirit of unity and peace, of love and joy. Now with saints and all the angels, we praise you forever. Holy, 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 God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.
You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body and spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Ephraim and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant, Francis our Pope, and Wilton our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin 
and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Bestow on us, we pray, O Lord, the spirit of charity, on the memorial of Our Lady, Queen of Peace, so that refreshed by the body and blood of your only begotten Son, we may be effective in nurturing among all the peace that he has left us, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Before giving the final blessing, I want to thank the committee again for asking me to, uh, to celebrate the Mass and for once again coming back to St. Joseph to have a Mass celebrated in honor of Our Lady Queen of Peace here at St. Joseph's is a beautiful gift to this parish, especially in such a difficult time. So I'm just delighted that we were able to, to have this Mass here uh, this year. Uh, maybe you're always welcome to St. Joseph's. Maybe next year we'll get some big shot priest, get Father Prayer to come back from Medjugorje or something like that. But it's just so wonderful we were able to be here. And I just I want to thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.
Thanks be to God. would like to introduce our second guest speaker, Deacon Daniel Maria Klimek. He received his vocation in Medjugorje as well and is soon to be ordained to the priesthood as a Franciscan Third Order Regular. He is a theology professor at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and has written a book that is the definitive study on Medjugorje entitled Medjugorje and the Supernatural, Science, Mysticism, and Extraordinary Religious Experience. He has a PhD in spirituality with distinction from the Catholic University of America, a Master in Divinity and Philosophy, also from Catholic University, and a Master of Arts in Religion from Yale Divinity School. Brothers and sisters, welcome. Welcome to this talk for the Medjugorje Conference. My name's Brother Daniel Maria, and I'm deeply, deeply honored to be able to speak to you about Our Lady of Medjugorje, who has just transformed my life, who has been so important in my vocation, and who I am as a friar, as a deacon, one day a priest. She has really led me, and she has been such a such an instrument uh, for me to fall in love with Jesus and to give my life. So really an honor to speak about her. Let us, uh, let us begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Mother Mary, just ask for your intercession, the grace of God to guide this talk. Holy Spirit, please touch the hearts of viewers with your message, with your anointing, with your proclamation. And we entrust this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I really believe in the profound power of testimony. Each of us has a spiritual testimony. Each of us has some type of 
narrative about how God has worked in our lives. And I love the quotes from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 11, that says, They defeated him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So I, lo I love that passage because it speaks to us how our testimonies can be a spiritual weapon how our testimonies can lead other people into healing, into deeper freedom, into an experience of God. So today, uh, dear brothers and sisters, I will be sharing with you in this talk uh, part of my testimony and speaking about Medjugorje, speaking how Our Lady has worked in my life. And you know, I, I grew up in a Polish Catholic family in Chicago but I wasn't very devout. I wasn't someone who really had an intimate, radical relationship with Jesus Christ. I had so many doubts. I didn't know whether He exists. I didn't know whether the Eucharist is real. I didn't know whether Our Lady is real. I remember I used to go to Mass, receive the Eucharist, then go pray by, by an icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. And as I was praying as a kid, I would often ask myself, am I just talking to myself? Am I just wasting my time? Or is there someone at the other end actually listening to my prayer? I had so many doubts, so many doubts. When I went to college at DePaul University, I remember I was taking a New Testament class and so we were reading about the miracles of Jesus, his healing miracles, his resurrection, of course, the incarnation. And I remember being very fascinated, but I, I, I kept asking in this skeptical way, is this real? Because if the miracles aren't real, if the healings aren't real, if the resurrection isn't real, if Jesus is not the supernatural gods, the supernatural Messiah, then he's just another influential teacher. You know, whether like Socrates or Buddha or Muhammad, if his miracles cannot be verified, if, you know, if I, if I cannot know that they are real, then I, I don't feel like I can give my life to him. So notice how my doubts my doubt came because I didn't know whether the supernatural is real. I didn't have a supernatural faith and I desired a supernatural faith. We live in a very rationalistic culture, right? Where, where we believe, especially in a secular Western culture, what we can touch, what we can feel, what we can see, what, you know, through sensorial perception. And then to believe in the invisible God that really takes a leap of faith. But what really changed for me was senior year of college. My mother was reading a book that was really transforming her. She was a devout woman, but I, know, I noticed how this book was still working to bring her to a deeper conversion. There was a more intensified spirituality. There was a deeper joy and peace in prayer. There was, a, there was a peace that she possessed even in the midst of struggles. And so you notice something was really happening here. And so she encouraged me to read this book. It was a title that I've never heard of before. It was called Medjugorje, The Message by Wayne Weibel. And I'm sure there are viewers who when they hear that title, they, they, they smile because that's known as the book of conversions. I was once having a conversation with Yvonne, the visionary's uh, translator in Chicago, and she called it the book of conversions when, when she heard about that book in my testimony. And really, really it is, because I remember reading it, it was profound. The act of reading started to slowly become a spiritual experience. In the midst of reading that book, I really felt the love and the presence and the beauty of God. And I felt Our Lady's voice. I felt her call. I wanted to respond to her call. I felt her beauty. I felt her loving, maternal, tender way. 
and I was fascinated by the lives of these visionaries, how, how they were normal teenagers and, and, and Yaakov, the 10-year-old child, and how after having these apparitions, they started going to daily Mass and they started staying after Mass for an hour or two hours in church for personal prayer. And they start fasting on bread and water twice a week, sometimes three times, and start praying daily rosary. And I realized I've never heard of such radical, powerful devotion amongst young people. So I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated. And so my heart is having this conversion experience. I'm feeling the presence of God. I'm feeling this deeper love. I'm feeling Our Lady's call. But my intellect is still being a little stubborn. My intellect, the, the rational mind, is still asking, can this be real? Can Marian apparitions be real in the late 20th and early 21st centuries? Can the mystical happen? So then I started reading other books, like uh, The Miracle Detective by Randall Sullivan which I would highly recommend. It's an absolutely fascinating book. Sullivan, a secular journalist, actually a Rolling Stone journalist, um, decided to study and investigate how the church examines the supernatural, how the church investigates uh, with science healing miracles or Marian apparitions. So he goes on this journey to Rome and eventually to Medjugorje, and he uh, stays with Miriana, the visionary. And it's just a fascinating uh, examination of a secular man's journey into the world of Catholic mysticism. And I remember one of the things that he captured really well were the scientific studies. How he literally wrote, uh, this is a quote, he wrote, I would find out that the apparitions in Medjugorje had been subjected to perhaps more medical and scientific examination than any other purported supernatural event in the history of the human race." End quote. So what profound words, right? That in the history of the human race, perhaps no phenomena has had so much, so much uh, scientific examination. There were scientists and doctors coming from France, from Italy, from Austria, from Germany, from Poland, from Canada, from the United States, testing the visionaries, using neuroscience, applying the EEGs to see what's happening inside their brains when they're experiencing their apparitions, uh, giving them uh, computerized polygraphs testing them with various psychological studies for their mental stability. And all the tests were able to show consistently over the years that the visionaries are not lying, that they're not experiencing any form of hallucination, no epilepsy, and that they are mentally healthy individuals, and also that they are experiencing something beyond scientific explanation when they fall into ecstasy and have their apparitions. In that very second, every single one of them enters a profound altered state of consciousness and it shows that something very unique is happening in that moment to them. So I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated by such studies. And I remember, I remember reading about the story of Dr. Marco Marginelli. This one really got me. Dr. Marginelli was a Italian neurophysiologist who was a huge uh, atheist, big skeptic, did not believe in mystical events. He actually used to go to places to try to disprove mystical events. So when he heard about Medjugorje, he traveled there in 1988 trying to disprove it. He conducted the uh, EEGs on the visionaries. He was able to see that they do enter a genuine state of ecstasy, that they're not lying, that something is happening in that moment. And he was with a pilgrimage group 
And there was a number of things that he observed which really made him uncomfortable. There was a woman who had leukemia in his pilgrimage group and she was miraculously healed during the pilgrimage. But what really got him was the behavior of the birds. Before the apparitions would begin, outside there would be hundreds of birds just chirping and cooing and being extremely loud. And Dr. Marginelli, he noticed how the seconds that the visionaries fell to their knees and had their apparitions, their ecstasies, every bird would go completely silent outside in that moment. And Dr. Marginelli, he would go back to Italy and he would give an interview where he said, this absolute silence of the birds, it horrified him. He didn't know what to make of it. And in a few months afterwards, Dr. Marginelli became a practicing Catholic. Praise God! <laughs> what a grace, what, what a beautiful, powerful experience with the God of the supernatural in Medjugorje. How fascinating that even, even nature, even the birds can be affected. And notice how for me, my doubt, my skepticism growing up was not being sure whether the supernatural is real, not being sure whether the supernatural God is real. And here you had a profound supernatural event, Marian visionaries experiencing apparitions of the Mother of God, scientifically tested, um, not able to disprove science, not able to disprove their experiences, actually supporting the integrity of their experiences by disproving all those pathological and natural explanations. And so I had a complete conversion reading this stuff because I realized if the mother of God can appear in the 21st century, then there's no reason why the miracles of Jesus Christ, her son, cannot be real in first century Palestine. If the Mother of God can appear, then there's no reason why the resurrection isn't real. So for me, Medjugorje led me to a deeper gospel spirituality. Medjugorje led me to fall in love with Jesus Christ, to believe in His healings, His resurrection, His incarnation, the fact that He is the Messiah. And it was doing wonders in my life. And I remember how one message in Medjugorje from Our Lady says, My dear children, if you live my messages, you will see miracles. If you do not, I cannot help you. And one of the miracles that I wanted to see in my life was actually a reconciliation in my family, a reconciliation between my parents. There are two people who unfortunately have had a very difficult marriage. One year they got into a big argument, it was on Christmas Eve, and then they just stopped talking to each other. It was a silent treatment that lasted for weeks, and then months, and then a year, and then numerous years. Two people living on, under the same roof, not saying a word to each other. It was horrible. And I remember, just a couple months after discovering Medjugorje, I started praying for them, a daily rosary, and I started fasting for them, uh, beginning to live the bread and water fast that the visionaries were living. And it was only two months later where I got a, I, I was away in graduate school and I got a phone call from my brother and he said something strange is happening and I said to him what do you mean well they're actually talking to each other <laughs> and I asked my mother how long has it been since you two have spoken to each other because to be honest I lost count over the years and she said six years 
six years that husband and wife lived under the same roof, not saying a word to each other. That's the kind of evil that the enemy wants to bring into the family. That's the kind of bondage that he wants to bring into the family. And notice how that bondage that the evil one brings into the family, Our Lady destroyed it in only two months. He, he had it for six years, she destroyed it in two months. Well, how? Through the spiritual weapons of prayer, fasting, the rosary, the interior sacrifice of one's hunger, offered in union with Christ's crucified. It's such a powerful spirituality. The spirituality of fasting on bread and water, it actually goes back to an ancient Christian spirituality. There's a, a ancient Christian text called the Didache, which is a text that's based on the teachings of the 12 apostles. And it, it tells us how the early Christians fasted on bread and water, Wednesdays and Fridays. Wednesdays, because historically, Wednesday is recognized as the day when Judas betrayed Jesus. And then Friday, of course, because that is the day of the Passion, the Crucifixion. So those were penitential days. But also medieval Christians fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays, and also some of them fasted on Saturdays to honor Our Lady, because Saturday is a Marian day. And I love, I love the power of fasting. You know, Jesus tells us in the scriptures, certain, certain demons can only be removed through prayer and fasting. So he tells the apostles how you need to give even more than prayer. So much that it gives us, so much depth that there's there in, in that beautiful spiritual practice. And my own journey with Medjugorje, it was really taking me places. I was seeing healing in my family. I was seeing reconciliation. I was seeing transformation in my own spiritual life. And I noticed that I also desired to study religion, desired to study more about the Christian faith. I was very blessed to get into Yale uh, Divinity School. So I went there uh, for a couple of years, graduated. And then I got into the Catholic University of America for a PhD program. And I was writing articles about Medjugorje and I really wanted to write my dissertation on the scientific studies of Medjugorje and how they challenge so much atheistic scholarship, uh, skeptical scholarship, because there's uh, so many atheist thinkers uh, for example, Richard Dawkins, one example, who label every visionary experience as hallucination or uh, lucid dreaming or maybe epilepsy, some scholars do. And I was fascinated with how in Medjugorje, the visionaries have been tested for all of these symptoms and were proven to be free of them and still experience something unique that is beyond scientific explanation uh, during their apparitions. So, so my dissertation studied how the science and the experiences of the visionaries really challenge these skeptical, atheistic thinkers regarding religious experiences. And I remember when I was uh, in graduate school, I dated, uh, I was in a couple relationships but somewhere along the line, I started also discerning religious life, uh, specifically priesthoods. And it was one of these experiences where it was so bipolar. You know, I would wake up one day, think to myself, okay, great, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a priest. I feel great consolation in this. You know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a knight for Our Lady, fight for her, fight for the kingdom. Just feel very on fire. You know, here we go. Yes. And then the next day I would wake up and the fear would overtake me and I would be thinking, oh, no, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't do this. Just, you know, there's 
I'm, I'm weak, I have anxieties, I have fears, you know, I can't be a priest. And it was just this up and down uh, journey for a long time, for months. And then I went to Medjugorje on pilgrimage. And I was fortunate to be in Medjugorje for three weeks. And I remember the second day of the pilgrimage, I was going to go to confession. And I remember there was an English line and there was an Italian line. In the English line, they were moving quickly. With the English line, um, I'm sorry, uh, in the Italian line, they were moving quickly. The Italian line kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, their priest was out. We haven't moved one person in the English line. So, I, you know, I was getting frustrated. I was thinking to myself, what is this guy preaching in there? And, and uh, eventually this little old lady comes out, you know, which was a great relief because, you know, I started thinking he's probably got a serial killer in there, um, but it wasn't. But uh, same situation, next person walks in, it was a young man, he takes as long as she did in there, almost an hour. And I'm thinking to myself, should I come back another day? I mean, this is ridiculous how long it's taking. And then when he came out, uh, uh, next young man, who may maybe was his brother, same situation, nearly an hour in there. But I noticed that when they come out, there's light on their face. They're really experiencing something special. And of course, there's absolution, such a special grace, but it felt like there's even something more happening. Finally, my turn came, I walked in, and it was a very special priest with an Irish accent who, who had the gift of reading souls. And it was my first encounter with that. I read about it in the lives of the saints like Padre Pio or St. John Marie Vianney. And here it was my first time experiencing it personally. This priest read my soul he knew my sins, he knew my struggles, and he was getting it right. And at one point, he asked whether he can pray over me. And I said, sure, Father. So he, he extended his hand over his forehead, over my forehead, started praying over me. Then extended his hand over my heart, started praying over me. And as he's praying over me, at one point he mumbles uh, to himself, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord, thank you, Jesus. And then he looks up at me and he says that Jesus is calling me to be a priest. And it was one of those powerful experiences where with those words, the fear disappeared. With those words, the anxiety disappeared. I trusted those words because he already read my soul. So I saw that this man has a special charism, a special grace. And I left that confessional feeling like the lightest person in the world, feeling like I, I can do anything now, feeling like, like I can go forward, the fear is gone. And this was only day two of the pilgrimage, <laughs> on a three week pilgrimage. So I came back to the United States and I was on fire and I was ready to become a priest and I was ready to join this Franciscan order, the TORs, Third Order Regular Franciscans, who were friends of mine at the university. And then, unexpectedly, this beautiful Catholic girl walked into my life. <laughs> Which I, I hear for some reason happens often when a guy is discerning. And I was weak, so I asked her out and we started dating. Despite all that, those experiences in Medjugorje. You can see how weak human nature can be sometimes. So we started dating and we discerned, we really discerned, you know, about this relationship because she knew I was discerning priesthood. And I remember there was a time when we were separated because it was spring break, she went to see her family and I stayed in DC. And I went to see my spiritual director 
And the question that we faced, the question that came up in spiritual direction, and I think it's such an important question for anyone who's discerning, whether religious life or marriage, the question was this, can you choose one vocation without regretting for the rest of your life that you didn't choose the other? And I realized, if I never become a husband and a biological father, I could live with that. I believe that I could live with that reality. However, if I never have the chance to absolve sins, to preach the gospel, to give spiritual direction as a priest, to consecrate the Eucharist, to celebrate Mass, to fully consecrate my life to Jesus Christ, I think I would always regret that, always regret that. So my spiritual director goes like, all right, Daniel, well, that's it. You know what you want, you know what you need to do. Now it's easy, now you just gotta break up, which as you know, is far from easy. But, um, but it was there, it was the truth. And I remember we had a conversation afterwards, my then girlfriend and I, and she was talking to me about a, a prayer experience that she had. She was saying how she was back in her home and she was in her room and she spent hours praying about this relationship, praying about whether or not this is where God is calling, calling us to. And it was frustrating, it was difficult, she was really wrestling with God. And at one point she felt a supernatural joy and she felt as if the Lord was asking her to step back from the relationship. And I asked her, when did this happen? What day was it? She said it was a Thursday, which was the same day that I went to spiritual direction and we discerned the same reality. So we had this beautiful, loving breakup where there was mutual support. So it was, uh, it was tender. And then she shared with me something very special. She shared with me how there, were, there was a moment a few months ago when she, she, she was praying for me and she received a vision. And it was a vision of my soul. And this was before we were even dating. It was a vision of my soul. And on my soul there was the mark of Christ's priesthood and then she heard the voice of God speak to her and God said to her three words protect his vocation and obviously back then before we were dating perhaps it was a strange request for her what responsibility does she have to protect my vocation but of course God knows everything and he knows that these two had a strong attraction for each other and he worked even in that reality. And so it's a beautiful confirmation, further confirmation of the vocation that the Lord was calling me to, the priesthood. And I just kept receiving these supernatural confirmations one after the other from having the priest in Medjugorje read my soul to having this beautiful vision that my then girlfriend experienced. And notice how God was really showing me, once again, his supernatural presence. I love the quote of Pope St. John Paul II. John Paul II said, today's world has lost its sense of the supernatural, but many are searching for it, and they find it in Medjugorje through prayer, penance, and fasting. I love that quote because it spoke to the heart of my own conversion, of my own experience. It pierced my heart because for me, it was searching for the supernatural. Too many people search for the supernatural in the wrong places, new agey places, but we gotta find it in where Jesus is acting, where Our Lady is acting, where God is allowing Christian mystical supernatural phenomena and Medjugorje was such a place for that, such a beautiful place. 
I love how in Medjugorje, speaking of the supernatural, Our Lady even gave the visionaries visions of the afterlife. She showed them three realms. She showed them that there is a heaven, there is a hell, and there is a purgatory. She said to them that these days, the largest number of people when they die go to purgatory. The second largest number go to hell, and the smallest go directly to heaven. Purgatory, according to the visionaries, was a place that they described as being very dark and foggy. One visionary described it as having this profound loneliness to it, um, comparing it to being in a cemetery on a, on a foggy winter day. And they heard the voices and the groans and moaning of, of the uh, souls in purgatory, you know, asking for prayers. And Our Lady explained to them that we need to pray for them, that when we pray for them, then they can be purified, that in purgatory they no longer have free will, and what, so they cannot pray for themselves. There will be no atonement in that way. They need our prayers, they need our intercession. And she said that when we pray for them, they become our friends, those poor souls. They pray for us, they intercede for us. And so it's a reciprocal relationship. So it's such an important thing to pray for those poor holy souls in purgatory. Heaven, they said, was a place of great beauty, great nature, mountains, meadows, Uh, a, a supernatural light permeated the souls who were in heaven. They had a supernatural joy. It was the kind of joy one visionary said that made, made you either want to sing or cry. It was so powerful. And of course, hell was the most disturbing place. They saw a great pit of fire. They saw souls come into, go into the flames of hell and coming out looking like grotesque animals with horrible darkened skin that no longer even resembled a human person. Um, why would these teenagers, these young people, and Yaakov, who was a 10-year-old child, be shown such horrific visions, at least the one of hell? And one visionary, Maria, explains, Our Lady showed it to us to, to really display that our lives have consequences. Our life has value, our life has meaning, and the moral decisions that we make on this life, in this world, on this earth, will influence our eternity. So how important it is to cultivate one's spiritual life, to pray, to fast, to go to Mass, to live the sacraments, to be charitable, to love one's neighbor, to become that person who can really become a light for others, a light of Jesus Christ. In Medjugorje, brothers and sisters, we have such an opportunity. Our Lady gives us messages. She gives us a spirituality that helps us become stronger, that helps us become vessels of light for other people, and that allows our lives to have deep meaning, meaning where, where eternity can be affected. You know, in Fatima, she said, she showed them a vision of hell in Fatima, too. And she said, so many go to hell these days because there are no, there's no one to pray and sacrifice for them. So when you pray for those who are far from God, when you pray for those who are on the verge of hell, or when you offer your fasting for them, that bread and water fast of Medjugorje, or any fast that you can do, you are participating in the salvation of the human race. One day you may come before God and be shown tens of thousands of people, if not more, who you've never met, who have come to heaven because when they needed grace, when they needed conversion, when they were far from God, when they were dying, your prayer was used, your sacrifice was used, and Jesus was able to bring the grace of conversion into their hearts and you played the role of a living instrument for the salvation of the world with Jesus and Mother Mary. What a gift! What a gift! 
let us always be true to the spirituality that they are calling us to and let us always do so with gratitude with love for jesus for our lady and the children that they want to save brothers and sisters such an honor to speak with you may god continue to bless you and this conference and please know of my gratitude and prayers god bless you my closing remarks we would like to invite you to join our team and help spread the love and peace from our lady queen of peace by volunteering we are looking for people across our country for more information email us at the marion center dc at gmail.com this event would not be possible without donations 100 percent of proceeds go directly towards the operational costs associated with this event. Look for the PayPal link on our website at www.mariancenter.org. Please stay in touch by adding this email address to your contacts list, the Marion Center DC at gmail.com. Thank you for having joined us and have a blessed day. Grazie.